Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, one thing you need to be aware of with these workshops, uh, it's a bit like a brand tub. You never know exactly when you stick your hand in what you're going to get out now if you come in august you'll get someone i think with a a phd who's written a book and he's a fellow of this and a director of that i'm none of those things i haven't written a book i haven't got phd Uh, i'm not a fellow of this or a director of that so uh feel free to leave now (laughs) and wait for the real experts to come along in august um Uh, My only qualification for being here is being an alcoholic who's been in AA for 29 years. Um, And what we're going to be talking about, or what I'm going to be talking about, uh, is the traditions in relationships. Um, Clancy always tells the story about the moment that a sponsor's heart sinks it's where your sponsee phones you up and says, I'm in a relationship. I need some advice. Uh, if you've ever sponsored people, your heart will have sunk at that point as well for lots of different reasons. Now, um, the big book has got plenty of material on relationships, but the traditions are an excellent guide for relationships. The 12 concepts are useful too. What they're good on is getting work done with other people in recovery in the service area. And you can apply it outside recovery as well. Uh, But getting work done in the service structure in a way which is effective, efficient and harmonious. The traditions, the the traditions are a mixed bag. They're uh, partly about how the group operates internally. They're partly about how groups relate to each other. And they're partly about how the fellowship operates internally. And then they're finally about how the fellowship relates to the outside world. And there are a few principles which are thrown into the mix as well. So the traditions, it's, they're really a bag of principles that were hammered out in the first 20 years or so that AA was in existence. And they're built on mistakes which had devastating consequences for groups. That's where they came from. They weren't sucked out of Bill W's fingers. Uh, They were constructed based on cold, hard experience of what worked and what didn't work. Um, Now, the notion of taking the traditions and the concepts to apply them in other areas is not new. There are various people who've done that over the years. Um, uh, there was a there's a Texan Al-Anon tradition of doing that, and more generally in Al-Anon now, the traditions and concepts for those who are diligent enough, which is quite a qualification, can be applied in all sorts of different areas and are regularly studied in Al-Anon far more than in AA. In my observation. Uh, so my home group, uh, it, it, the concepts get read out on a regular basis. The traditions are studied every single week. Um, in AA, everyone groans when it gets to the traditions. And also the al literature overtly talks about applying the principles and the traditions and the concepts in other areas. The AA literature doesn't. Um, not, not in any broad sense. So occasionally there are There are little nudges in that direction. Uh, There's a chap called Dennis F., who uh, I think is still sober. He got sober in the early 70s, who wrote a series of essays, I think around 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago now, about the steps, the traditions and the concept, how they can be applied in AA within the home and within outside settings as well they're very useful i think there are a couple of people here who've got the links to the dennis f materials if they could post those during the uh talk that would be very very helpful um but 
I'm going to talk specifically about traditions in, in relationships. And the example I'm going to give is, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be a bit naughty now. You know, when, you know, when you go and see a therapist about your marriage, you're not allowed to ask them if they're married. They start to become very vague. Or so, well, so I'm sure some do. But ones I went to, you ask them a personal question, you get a very gruff response. It all gets turned around with something like, well, what difference would it make were I married? And they, they focus it back on. You're not allowed to ask. You're not allowed to say to your therapist, are you happy? Is what you're feeding me? I, how is it working for you? You don't get to ask that with most, most of them. In AA, it's, it's a little bit different. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. So, uh, in as far as I can be qualified to talk about traditions in the relationships, well, first of all, I do apply them. That's one qualification. Secondly, uh, I've been, I'm married. I've been with someone for 18 years. Um, and we don't argue. And not only do we not argue, we don't need to argue. We don't have anything to argue about. Uh, now, I can bang on about how happy we are, but I think those two facts probably are sufficient uh, to speak for themselves. Uh, we get on very well. Everything works very, very smoothly within the household. I was in a relationship with someone else in AA for eight years before that. Uh, this is now 18 years with someone who is is not in, in AA. So I'm going to go through this in a linear way, tradition by tradition. So tradition one, I'm going to read out the tradition, say how I apply it in, in our relationship. My other half, by the way, this is the funny thing about the traditions. Uh, they look like magic to us. They look like information that's come from another, another galaxy. To people who are healthy, they are common sense. <laughs> So my other my other half uh, naturally applies all of these traditions uh, without having without having had to have been told about it. In fact, I've learned more about the traditions from him through him just naturally applying the principles contained within them than I ever have from hearing people bang on about them. So a lot of what you're going to hear, his ears will be burning throughout this, I'm sure. Um, so tradition one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. If you're in a lifeboat, the last thing you want to do is shoot holes in the bottom of the lifeboat. So I think if the relationship has an unwritten rule, it's this. Uh, we don't attack each other. We don't criticize each other. Uh, and we don't argue. It, it's, it's those three things. We don't attack. We don't criticize. We don't argue. If you want to maintain unity, avoid those three things. When we've been together, uh, so I'm not the virtuous one here. I'm the one that, that, that was a slower learner than he was. We were together for three or four years at the point of this anecdote, so many years ago now. I was doing the dishes, and it occurred to me, it occurred to me that I seem to be doing the dishes rather a lot. In fact, I seem to be doing the dishes all of the time. I was the one that was doing the dishes constantly. And I said something like, I don't think it would hurt if you did the dishes occasionally <laughs> and I looked round to see what the response was and his face went white and he left the room and I thought oh god I've done it now and I had and about five minutes later he came back he said I have never ever criticized you and he left the room, and that was the end of that conversation. In fact, it was the end of all conversations until about 5 p.m. that evening where normal communications resumed. Um, I shot a hole in the bottom of a lifeboat, and this was not on, and we haven't done it since. Does this mean things can't be discussed? No, we'll come to that. 
but direct criticism or nastiness or attack are just out of bounds because the vessel that is carrying the two of us is more important than any agenda of the individual. And the quickest way to destroy the relationship is to engage in any of those, any of those behaviors. Uh, there's a recovery writer who's not very well known. There's quoted by some people from Minnesota. I think he was writing and working in the seventies and the eighties. I may be wrong about that, but that's approximately when he was writing Ernie Larson E-A-R-N-I-E, Larson. Of course, he's from Minnesota. He's called Larson. Um, and he did a study where they identified the seven uh, behavior patterns which cause people to feel love. Or how do you express love? What does that actually mean? And the seven were these. Number one, don't attack the other person. <laughs> If you want them to feel loved, don't attack them. It shouldn't need to be said, but it does. <laughs> you defend them. So when attack comes from the outside, you side with them, not against them. This can happen at dinner parties where a third party or a fourth party is there and one person sides with the visitors against the other person. I've seen that happen before. So you side with the person you're in the relationship with. It doesn't mean you have to defend the indefensible. That's different. But you side with them. You encourage them, which is straightforward. You admit them into the inner world. Not necessarily into everything, but there has to be some admission to the inner world. You treat the person as important. You accept them as they are, and you treat them as valuable. Now, this was not on fridge magnets when I was growing up. So this was actual new information to me. Tradition one is interesting, though. It's not about the complete sacrifice of the individuals. It's about the recognition that the vessel of the relationship is what is carrying the individuals. So the unity must always come first. But as it says in the 12 and 12, personal welfare comes second. And the questions that we ask each other a lot are these. What can I do for you? And, uh, and you've, got to be, <laughs> you've got to be careful with the next one. What would you like me to start doing, stop doing, or do differently? What would you like me to start doing, stop doing, or do differently? And this is particularly useful if the other person is clearly upset in some way, because it gives them the, op you don't, you don't have to drag it out of them. If you ask them that question, they'll tell you, <laughs> they really will. Um, and that's, those are questions we ask on a regular basis. Now, of course, you don't want to hand a psych uh, someone who is psychotic a blank check, but uh, this is the point. If you're in a relationship with someone reasonable, you can ask that question safely. If it's not safe to ask that question, why are you there? Um, I learned a, an interesting lesson in Al-Anon. I love Al-Anon. They teach interesting lessons that you won't hear anywhere else. Um, I read in Making Crises Work for You on those snappy Al-Anon titles. It said, you can't expect reason from an unreasonable person. You cannot expect logic from an illogical person. I did not know this. I thought that if you explained things carefully enough and hammered, eventually you'd extract reason from an unreasonable person. But you were. I, I, the, 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 this is all predicated on finding someone else who's reasonable and working with that rather than finding unreasonable people and then trying to train them, which is what I did when I was drinking. Um, tradition two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. So when decisions need to be made, about holidays, 
about whether or not to have a cleaner, about when to eat dinner, about what temperature the room is, about whether the window is going to be open or shut. You know, these very important people underestimate the importance in a relationship of what temperature you agree the room is going to be. It's amazing (laughs) how not resolving that leads to all sorts of problems. But the point is, tradition two, um, to be overt in those communications, this, this, is con, this is concept 12 as well. Uh, discussion, vote, and substantial unanimity. How do you have substantial unanimity between two people? You both have to agree. Now, the boss level hack for this is what this means is that a lot of the time I just have to compromise and say that's fine. <laughs> because it's the only way agreement is going to be reached. Um, Don Pritz um, would say that uh, his relationship advice was a relationship with someone, another human being is a lot like your relationship with God. You'll get along just fine if you memorize and repeat the phrase, often thy will be done. Uh, now, compromise is a sort of dirty word in in. Um, Alan on sometimes because the, the the trope is that when I was a child I never had a voice no one ever listened to me but now I'm in recovery everyone is going to listen to me I was at a meeting once and everyone was saying that they'd found their voice and uh, a lovely Glaswegian female friend of mine she said she said I found my voice when I found recovery and I found it was a sledgehammer so um Compromise can have a bad reputation. Compromise is not backsliding into codependent behavior. It's how adults operate. How important is it is one of my favorite Al-Anon slogans. Uh, Often something is important only because I've decided it's important that I've drawn a line in the sand. So, well, this is this is what we're going to have the battle about. And it's not remotely important. It's only important because I've decided it's important. Um, Concept nine also talks about a leadership. One great leadership skill is to accept um, progress through an endless sequence of unsatisfactory compromises. I'm going to say it again to, to seek progress through an endless sequence of unsatisfactory compromises. Each compromise looks unacceptable. But when you put the compromises in a row, you discover you've got an acceptable outcome. Um, And with learning to uh, learning to live with another person, um, you see what I think is reasonable looks insane to him and vice versa. Um, uh, My other half is ethereal and mystical and kind of you know fairy like in the not in the in the sort of uh, pejorative sense but in the in the sort of mythological sense whereas i'm more like a civil engineer i mean it's it, it, it the relationship should not work what i think is normal and reasonable looks insane to him and vice versa um I'm very four square. He comes at things sideways. The only way we can form a relationship is if both of us compromise hugely. Now, what I feel of as great compromises to him are going to seem perfectly reasonable concessions to (laughs) his way of thinking. Compromises always feel much more painful on the side that they're being made than on the side they're being received. They seem like a return to sanity to the other person, whereas to you, it feels like you, you, you've given up a kidney or something. Um, but what I've discovered with compromising on huge numbers of things, I discover I'm happy. There we go. Because that's what I'm after, ultimately, at the end of the day. Also, it means that no one is in charge of anything. Uh, And I don't want to get too much into the concepts. You can apply the concepts to this. So it's as though the the, the, the family unit is like the conference, and that has to come to these big decisions on large matters of general policy and finance through discussion vote substantial unanimity now they can be in charge in this but, but it's by delegation so i'll give you an example 
when it's one of my cooking nights, I'm in charge. When it's one of his cooking nights, he's in charge. But it's authority which is delegated by us who've sat down together as a family and said, right, who's in charge of what? And then that person's in charge. But neither of us have the ability to pull rank except in an emergency. So if I'm doing something incredibly dumb or dangerous, uh, usually not looking where my elderly mother is going or what she's doing, he'll he will pull rank uh, and very occasionally i've had to pull rank on i had to pull rank on getting a passport once uh but it's very very rare but one one neither of us act as though we're in charge if anything is important it's the group which decides tradition three the only requirement for aa membership is a desire to stop drinking and tradition three in the long form and in the literature is very interesting it talks about no rules no conformity a doesn't demand anything of me as long as I'm I, I basically will sit quietly, take my turn, not disrupt the meeting and not do, any, do anything untoward in meetings. I can really be who I am. Um, and applied to the relationship. Uh, we don't make demands of each other. Uh, we don't see each other to see ourselves as entitled to anything from the other person. No conformity is required if you want to be in it and you're happy to make it and you want to make the relationship work that's the only requirement desire to be in the relationship and i got this from this alanon in texas tradition three in relationships you must desire to be in the relationship and make it work i've been in relationships in my drinking where i was in a relationship but at the same time acting as a saboteur but but still looking on the surface like I wanted the relationship to work. There has to be a sincere desire to make it work and to make whatever sacrifices are necessary to make it work. Um, to join AA, you don't have to bring anything. You don't have to pay any dues or fees. Whatever you have to bring, which is yourself, is enough. Um, and this speaks to this topic of entitlement. There are, there are a couple of years where... Uh, I, my job, I mostly correct commas, whereas he does something very important. And for a couple of years, he was doing very, very important things. And, oh, I don't know what was going on. He never used to tell me what was going on, but I knew something was going on. Dirty work was afoot, and there were machinations and schemes and plots, and he was the object of all of this. And a uh, nasty affair, I later discovered. But for two years... He was preoccupied for two years. I'm not talking two evenings. For two years, he kind of wasn't really available. And I made the decision, my job is to be supportive of him. If, he's ava if he becomes available again, great. If he doesn't, that's fine. Maybe my job is just to support him. And then he became available again in all sorts of ways. There are times he's super available. There are times he's not. There are times I'm, I'm super available. There are times I just can't even. And that's okay. I'm not, we're not, we're allowed not to have anything to offer on any given day. It's just like Clancy says, that on, at any given moment, sobriety is sufficient across the course of your sobriety more than just sobriety is necessary you're going to need to do some work and sort your crap out and in the relationship of course a little more than just being present is necessary across the course of the relationship but at any particular point in the relationship the other person's existence is sufficient they don't need to do anything or perform in any way at all to be totally accepted and loved tradition four each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or aa as a whole now this is the absolute core of what makes it work um each aa group is autonomous but aa groups can get together to do things like conventions and conferences and public information and literature and intergroups and picnics and camp outs, whatever they are. Uh, you know, but each group does what it wants. And 
the it, in Star Trek you have the is it called the Prime Directive something like that the Prime Directive uh, in the relationship is I have my life he has his life my life is none of his business his life is none of my business except in as far as we want to let the other person in but we have a common life which is the family life and that is both our businesses in a joint way uh, which means i've never looked at his phone i've never hacked into his facebook account i never rifle through his papers and vice versa the absolute granting of confidentiality and privacy whatever he wants to tell me there are things i don't know about his life from before i met him and if he wants to tell me he can and if he doesn't want to that's fine by virtue of being in a relationship with him i do not have possession or entitlement to anything um uh a friend of mine an acquaintance of mine says one of the most chilling notions is two people at the early stages of an intimate relationship sitting on the sofa watching the television and when the commercial break comes up one of them turns the volume down turns to the other other takes their hand and says no secret day eh? um you know, we're not living in 1984 with a huge screen in the room that can see everything you're doing. Um, Rabbi Manis Freedom, uh, Freeman, well, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, Manis Freeman talks about allowing other people to have the dignity of growing in their own way, of having character defects, which you exercise modesty in relation to so when they're showing a character defect you look the other way as you would if someone you don't know were unclothed you would look the other way to allow someone the privacy to whatever internal world they have and however that manifests externally um and so there's autonomy um he doesn't have to run anything about his life past me and vice versa. As a courtesy, if something in my life is going to affect him, I will ask him and secure permission. So uh, I, I travel for various reasons uh, uh, separately than him. So we go on holiday together, but I travel for various reasons. If I have a trip planned, I'll say before I book the ticket, here are the dates I'm planning to go to so-and-so. Is this okay with you? Because it affects him because he's, he's doing everything on his own. I'm not going to be there for a few weeks. Um, similarly, if he has to make a decision which affects me, he asks me. But it's a, it's a courtesy rather than an invitation to control. So again, this works if both people are essentially respectful of the other person's private domains. So you've got two private domains and a common domain. Uh, sometimes the, uh, there is an occasional need. People talk about boundaries. And Al-Anon is a, it's a funny old place for boundaries because um, as soon as a new Al-Anon member gets wind of this notion of boundaries, they speak of nothing else for about five years. And, and if, you, if ever you do, if ever anyone who's here is giving an Al-Anon workshop, on, doesn't matter what the topic is, uh, if you have a question and answer session, every single question is going to be the presentation of some situation about the husband or the wife or the child or the parent about some aspect of their behavior. The individual finds objectionable, or disagreeable. How can I set a boundary? I want to set a boundary. Um, and, and luckily, this phase eventually passes. Uh, <laughs> but you have to sort of... Um, grit your teeth and bear it for a while. Now, uh, I think boundaries are the death of a relationship. At the, the absolutely deadly. Because what they do is they construct these sort of minefields that the other person has to tiptoe through. Uh, uh, what we do have is uh, this notion of the polite request. And a polite request is simply that. In the 12 and 12, 
in the step part of the 12 and 12, it talks about the difference between a request and a demand is plain to anyone. Now, they say that. I don't think it is plain to anyone. Um, when I <laughs> Historically, when I've made a request, it comes out like, like a demand. A request is something which is voiced only once, and if the answer is no, you don't pull a face, sigh, or repeat the request. <laughs> If you do any of those tactics, it ain't a request, it's a demand. doesn't matter how nicely you word it and explain it, it's now a demand. Because you've now told the other person to have my approval, then you're going to have to, to, to play ball. So we make polite requests, we limit ourselves. It, there, there's some, it, the requests seem to, uh, or certain types of requests, where they involve the other person changing their behaviour. They seem to exact a price which is paid by the general pool of goodwill in the relationship. If you make too many, it turns the relationship into something else in my experience. So I'm much more ginger about making requests than I used to be. And, and making too many, making the same request over and over and over becomes bullying. And I've been guilty of that. And I was pulled up on that uh, quite rightly. Um, but again, there's a wonderful line on page 118 of the big book. Live and let live is the rule. If you both show a willingness to remedy your own defects, there will be no, little need to criticize each other. And I've discovered that um, when Jonathan leaves his lots of clothes lying around, he will eventually put them away. I don't need to remind him every six months eventually now eventually it can literally be a year but eventually it gets put away he's just on a different time schedule than me that's fine five each group has but one primary purpose to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers now what is the primary purpose of the relationship um Someone once sent me, sent us, in fact, a, an anniversary card. And the picture on the card was of a rowing boat seen from below the prow. And in the prow of the rowing boat were two. There was a, a, a golden Labrador and a, a, a black Labrador. And they were sitting there very proudly in the prow of this boat. And it struck me, well, this is a perfect image for the relationship. It is a vessel which carries us through life in a far more robust and reliable way than we could proceed through life under our own steam. Uh, the two dogs are able to just sail down the river as opposed to having to constantly paddle. It is the combination which gives it its strength, which is far... And so the the strength it confers is far greater than the sum of its parts. A third thing is created, which is this invisible, this invisible vessel, which is what is being protected. And you can't see it. Well, I know that's in the nature of invisible vessels, but it's worth repeating. The vessel of the relationship is completely invisible. Uh, you don't see it until you get through situations with ease that you would have struggled with on your own. Um, if you sponsor men, uh, by the time they've been in a relationship for five, six, seven years, they start phoning their sponsors with a particular, particularly whiny voice. I did. Um, uh, six or seven years into a relationship, the romance has gone out of it. The spark has gone out of it. I just don't feel the way I used to as though the relationship is all about um, uh, the feelings that you see portrayed in cheap Netflix teen series set in some high school in Massachusetts. Um, you know, it's the wrong model in my experience. Uh, the, uh, I, I made that mistake myself a few years in thinking there was something missing. It's like complaining after you've been going to a gym for five years that your free pass you had for the first week is no longer valid. 
my experience, all of that, all of that sort of flattery stuff is, is, is what gets you through the door, but it's not what keeps you there. It's recognizing that, that this invisible fortress has been built. And that is, to me is what it's about. That's uh, traditional five is building that vessel. Six, an AA group will never endorse finance or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. So this is about faithfulness. I'm going to be so controversial now. Um, <laughs> someone once gave me the advice, and I think it was good advice. One relationship at a time have you got that nod slowly if that makes sense one relationship at a time there we go that will just simplify so many things you have to have fewer changes of clothes for one thing uh you don't need to carry toiletries around in your little bag pretending that they're for some other purpose but anyway faithfulness what it means is that my energy must not be dissipated in other directions so this is not just about having one relationship it's about averting my mental energies from even considering other things so that the energy is all pointed that energy the relevant energy is all pointed within the relationship um the second thing as well now aa is not without problems of money, property, and prestige, and so on. That's a sort of shorthand for the whole bucket of worldly concerns. They're not absent from AA, but they're kept in their place. So those lower order concerns, particularly money and material things, we keep them very deliberately um, outside our discourse. So uh, there's all sorts of administration to running a joint household. Uh, I happen to, to do the bulk of the administration. And if I need to do any of that administration, which involves his consent or cooperation or something, I, I do it during business hours when we're both at work. I do not bring those questions and matters and things to do and lists into the evening when we're together. It's work. It's not because it put all of that material stuff. It makes people edgy. This is exactly the same in AA. As soon as you're talking about material things, it's all very nice when you're talking about God and fellowship and, and spiritual growth. Everyone's very happy with that. You start talking about money and property and plans and practical things. Everyone gets tense. If you've ever been to a group conference or a business meeting, tense. So we keep the uh, we keep lower order concerns out of the, the joint living space as it were. Uh, he never talks about work at home. I don't talk about work at home. Um, if we talk about stuff, we'll go on a walk and talk about it. So it doesn't come into, uh, doesn't come into the lounge or the bedroom. Those topics are separate, which means that when we're together, it's like being on a date for 18 years because that other stuff is kept in its place. Um, what else? Uh, seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. So the family is, we jointly are financially self-supporting. But in our case, because we both work, we're individually self-supporting. So <clears throat> to mirror tradition four, I have my money, he has his money, and we have joint finances. What he does with his money is none of my business. What I do with my money is none of my business. As long as we can both contribute to the common pot, we're good. This saves an awful lot of arguments. It is very clear what expenditure is covered jointly and what expenditure 
is covered individually. Um, also exercising warranty two of concept 12, financial prudence, uh, because <laughs> I'm prudent and he's successful. This is a very good combination. It means we don't have to argue about money because we both have buffers. Um, this has made the relationship a lot easier. I was taught, this is what, one of the few things, sometimes, you see, my Al-Anon, my Al-Anon spiel for years was, well, I wasn't taught anything when I was growing up. I was, I was taught how to budget and how to be careful with money. Now, it's not an insignificant thing. I might have been, not been taught important things about human relationships, but budgeting I can do. <laughs> um, to, again, to keep the relationship in a safe vessel, the material stuff does need to be looked after, but it needs to be looked after using the principles of the program. We're not dependent on each other as well. This is the interesting thing. Um, we've got dependence, which is very bad. Um, we've got uh, deep, so, so dependence is a disaster. Codependence, which is all of this entanglement is a disaster. Now, what we've got, I, I think, can be best described as an alliance. In an alliance, there isn't dependence. So being fully self-supporting through my own contribution spiritually means that I, I rely on my inner resources, which ultimately connect to a power greater than myself. Sometimes my other half is the channel for those emotional, spiritual resources, and sometimes not. But I'm not dependent on him for those. I'm dependent on my higher power. He has his own. He'd deny he has a higher power, but my sponsor thinks he's a mystic. So, you know, you can work that one out yourself. He has inner resources, as described in the spiritual appendix two in, in Big Book. But the interesting thing about Tradition 7, a, a, for a group to function in AA, it's got to be able to survive with outside without outside contributions. Uh, my life is viable without the relationship. His life is viable without the relationship. Our lives individually were viable without the relationship, which means the relationship was not co-opted to fill some uh, disastrous emotional gap in either of us. So what we were bringing to the deal was... Uh, we were bringing abundance to the relationship. We weren't seeking for the other person to plug a gap. Um, more can be said about that, uh, but that's enough on that for now. Uh, but the relationship fixes nothing. Uh, someone said to me once, if you want a relationship, uh, you're lacking in opportunities for forgiveness and service because those are the two primary things that are going to happen if you get into a relationship there's an awful lot you're going to discover you have to forgive by withdrawing your judgment of and there are an awful lot of ways you're going to have to be of service and it will require you to not do other things you would otherwise have done but it's not there to fix anything. If there is anything which needs fixing, it needs to get fixed elsewhere. Or the relationship is simply a way of using the other person to do something for me that I ought to be doing for myself in combination with my higher power. Um, tradition eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Um, the Dennis F. principle here is this, that we do what we do. We give what we give in this relationship for fun and for free, expecting nothing in return. The other idea from Tradition 8 is uh, professional standards are not required in, in anything. What, so, so we count up from zero and whatever is available is great. We're not counting down from a professional standard. And no scorekeeping, not, you know, how many times have I done this? It's now your turn. That's what bean counters do. And for it to be a real relationship as opposed to a business transaction, there must be no keeping score. Because, and this is one of the reasons why, I think, is what each person 
is bringing to the relationship. What I bring to the relationship is very, very visible to me, but will often be invisible to him. What he brings to the relationship is very visible to him, but invisible to me. It, invisible, but enormously impactful. So I'm not qualified to be the accountant to the relationship because I can only see things truly from my point of view. So no scorekeeping. Uh, tradition nine, AA as such will never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Uh, and just the general principles of tradition nine here. Uh, organize as much as necessary, but as little as possible um, to allow flexibility. And also, Tradition 9 introduces the concept of delegation, which is actually the topic of all, all 12 uh, concepts, one way or another. So we each have delegated roles within the relationship. There are things that, uh, so I look after the finances, I look after a number of other things. Um, medical matters is what he does for a living. He deals with important questions about my mother. His common sense is several notches more acute, incisive and accurate than mine is. So he, he's like got a, these delegated roles, as I do, about what we're good at, plays to our strengths. And that's how dele delegation best works. Um, Tradition 10, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. So um, a couple, a couple of, I've touched on this a little bit already, but a number of uh, number of things are uh, none of my business. Is that famous saying? There are three types of business in the world: there's my business, God's business, and none of my business. Uh, what he's thinking is none of my business. If he wants to tell me, he can, but he needn't. If he makes a request, please, can you do this? I'm not entitled to know why. If he wants to know why, if he wants to tell me why, he can. Uh, Manus Friedman tells the story about a, a, a stereotypical couple, um, Old, maybe an old-fashioned model, but she looks after the home. He comes home from work. He throws his coat over the banister. She says, would you mind hanging your coat up? Please, could you hang your coat up? Now, love would require him to, to do so because of who is asking. As soon as he asks the question, well, why do you want me to hang it up? There's no love. There's no love for the person. It's like, if you can present a strong enough case, the, the board will examine your, your proposal. No, you're, you're in a different realm by asking why. So the answer is yes, and sometimes the reason one's curious about it. But the answer is yes before you hear the answer as to why when the other person makes a request. What is going on inside him is his business, not mine. So no peeking and peering in any way. Um, if the, I first went to AA in January 93, uh, been sober since July 93, uh, a little while after that, I, I started to go to Al-Anon. And there have been periods I've gone very intensively. There have been periods when I, I've, I've gone not at all. But one thing I noticed, um, ooh, I think I was about 14 or 15 years sober, and so 13 years that I'd been going to Al-Anon on, on and off. And I remember realizing that in Al-Anon, I'm in a room full of people who are hypervigilant, whereas in AA, I'm in a room full of people who are thinking largely of themselves. Being the Al-Anon, of course, I'm the one doing the noticing in the AA room. But that hypervigilance is, when you start noticing it, is really intrusive. It's one of the things that made my, it made the house I grew up in very difficult at times because you felt under surveillance. Because you were under surveillance, <laughs> that's why you felt it. 
This isn't intuition. Their literal eyes were literally looking at you, seeing what you were monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. Um, and so leaving people, just leave them be. My friend Anthony, his sponsor, um, will send him emails about him and his other half where this it's just the subject line says leave him alone lots of things are none of my business so mind my own business keep my big fat mouth shut um i've invited him to come to aa meetings out of curiosity he's never done so um and i asked him why once and he said well that's your stuff <laughs> He doesn't need, he doesn't need to know what's going on here, uh, which I think is very healthy. Uh, in Tradition 10, in the literature, it talks about staying out of politics and religion. So Jonathan and I do not discuss politics or religion. Uh, as King Lear says, that way madness lies. There are plenty of other people I can discuss that with. But frankly, if you've ever tried discussing politics or religion with anyone, I, I wouldn't bother if I just, just let that one go. Talk about macrame or something, much less controversial. Um, tradition 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. This means when I have an idea, I don't need to sell it. I did not know this. Um, I, I'm, uh, a few years ago, I went on... Uh, 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 I planned a trip to uh, Arizona for various reasons. There was something I was going to, but I was going to take an extended period and look around and go here and go there. And I wanted him to come. So I proceeded to try and sell it. I sent him, I mean, it's so embarrassing. You know, I sent him pretty pictures of Sedona. Here's a website about Sedona. Have a look at this. He can Google if he wants to find out about Arizona, he can spell it. It's not hard to spell. There are states which are hard. Mississippi can be hard to spell. Tennessee can be hard. Arizona, you don't need, you don't need to look that one. You just tap it into Google. I did not need to sell the idea because it's manipulation. Tradition 11 says you tell people that you're there. You don't make any big claims about AA. You just tell people it's there. Hey, we're here. This is what we do. If you want to call us, here is our telephone number. Bye. And that's it. No lurid campaigns. No, no nothing dramatic. So if I have an idea that I'd like to do something with him, if it, whether it's a holiday or going for a walk, I just say what the idea is and let him draw his own conclusions. Gives them a lot more space and PS, they're much more likely to say yes. <laughs> so if you do want to have your own way, <laughs> my experience is that if you don't sell it, they're more likely to say yes, to just buy it. As soon as you, tr so a lot of people, he's like this. If you try and sell something, he clams up. So no manipulation. Um, at all uh there's that alanon it's not an official alanon slogan uh but uh, wait why am i talking and waste why am i still talking so i think connected with this is no attention give it a sec there we go okay uh, no attention seeking in the relationship. Um, I'm the most frightful attention seeker. I'm like a, a, so he's basically a cat and I'm basically a dog. Um, and we should not get on, but we do. So I just want attention, attention, attention. And I realized when he's sitting in the living room and he's reading, he does not want to be addressed. And I realized at one point, every time I went past the living room, I would look in to see if he was looking up, to see if he would give me attention. But they know 
when you walk past the door, whether you're looking at them or whether you're looking straight ahead. The, per the peripheral vision is very acute. So manipulation can happen in all sorts of really subtle ways. What, but you've got to be aware. You've got to be present. What am I doing? And why am I doing it? And a great way of not manipulating attention in, in a relationship is to play a game called, you might want to write this down, it's called My Turn, Your Turn. In My Turn, Your Turn, I take my turn and then you take your turn. And it's not my turn until you've taken your turn. How does this work in practice? If we're having a conversation, I'll say something and then he says something. And then I say something. And if he doesn't say anything else, the conversation is over. It's now his turn. I don't keep needling until he continues. I was not aware I was doing any of this. It's been very, very slow realizing these subtle forms of manipulation. But the, the motto is leave them be. Um, tradition, tradition 12 Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. So um, with getting things done around the house, it doesn't matter who does it. What matters is that it gets done. And fair is not, I don't think the word fair is anywhere in the big book or anywhere in the traditions. It doesn't matter what's fair. So I don't ask myself, is it fair? If it needs doing and I see it, I do it. If I'm more observant, yeah, I'm going to do more. Well, that's the price of being observant. There we go. Because the alternative is bullying them. Because you, that someone said to me, you're not going to change him. Any way in which he is, is for deep psychological reasons, which he doesn't even have access to you, to you let, he, let alone you. So yeah, you might as well accept them as they are, because they're not going to change, certainly not on your schedule. Um, and also the, the anonymity part of this is the ultimate reliance is on God, not on the individual. What makes me comfortable in the relationship is... I know if, it, if, if for whatever reason, because it can happen for a hundred reasons, uh, the relationship is not ended. Well, either if the relationship is ended by the death of one of us or the relationship ends for some other reason. There are complicated reasons why even good relationships will end after many, many years. Uh, I've got comfortable with that in advance. I, w I won't like it but I'm comfortable with the idea. That allows me to be comfortable in the relationship and not insecure. If I'm insecure, it means I'm reliant on the relationship of the other person, not on God. And that's the ultimate message behind Tradition 12 is that my reliance is on God, not on them. So uh, that's all I've got. Patrick, do you want to uh, take over momentarily? Yes, uh, thanks, Tim. Thanks, great stuff, man. Loved your, loved it all. Took a lot of notes. Stuff I got to be very aware of. <laughs> so, um, yeah, with that, I'll turn it back to Tim for the Q and A. Um, so that remember, it's been recorded, and if you don't want your voice on the recording, you can just send that uh, directly. Uh, send your request directly to Tim, and we we'll limit the time if you can. You know questions usually don't take more than a minute or so uh, just so we can get as many in and uh, uh, I'll turn it back to Tim now thanks Tim thank you uh, Lily you've got a question hi Lily alcoholic uh, I live in Boca Raton uh, but I'm from Serbia so I enjoy all of your shares and your experience I am not in a relationship. I'm in two and a half years uh, in sobriety and I'm just busy with my programs and happy with my life, how it goes. But I have a friend who always asks me, and I know I suppose not to give advice, but for example, and I think this is tradition 11, I took all these notes and I think it's tradition 11. So she wants to go with me 
to a um, conference in December, AA conference. Okay. Her boyfriend, also long-term in a relationship, long-term in sobriety. Uh, she and I are kind of new, but he's long-term. He doesn't want to go. It's in New Orleans, okay? And he doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to go. But she wants to go. And now, what, she, what do they do? What she does? What, what does she need to do? Which tradition to apply to get this situation? So that I would, that's what I would like. When I talk to her, I would refer to traditions and stuff like that. So I can help her. Thank you. That's, that's an interest. That's an interesting question. Um, one of the difficulties with 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 questions about relationships is uh, it depends on what rules you've entered the relationship with. Uh, I know I've heard because I've heard other AA members, Al-Anon members, uh, talking about the application of the traditions and the concepts in relationships. And there was, there's one particular, I'm not going to say who they are, but when I hear them, it makes my blood run backwards because the, the amount of control each person has of the other person's life. Uh, I'll say in my relationship with uh, uh, Jonathan, if I want to go on a trip and he doesn't want to come, I go on the trip and he lets me go. If the ground rules of a relationship are that uh, any trips have to be signed off by both those the ground rules of the relationship this is and this is this is um the a tradition for question um there are some aa groups which are incredibly restrictive um uh of their members and there are others which which really allow anything um i've heard people construe the traditions and the concepts to mean that in a relationship, all of your finances must be pooled and that any expenditure by either person, because it automatically affects the common pool, must be decided on jointly. I would I would be I would have packed by the time that even gets discussed. I would <laughs> be gone. Uh, so there are different ways of doing this. So it, I'm, I'm afraid there isn't a simple answer to that because each relationship is autonomous. It's its own entity and gets to set its own get, gets to set its own rules. But uh, I've been, you know, in, in in shorter relationships, in between the other longer relationships, where I wasn't happy with the rules the other person wanted to impose, so I was off, and vice versa. So, so that's how I got on that. Uh, Makeda, would you like to pose your question? Hi, yes. Uh, thank you for this. It's very good. Um, I want to know how you deal with people or yourself when people lie. And I'm not talking about, you know, cash register lie. I'm talking about lie about their feelings and lie about um, what they're doing, just the lying people. And I'm not talking about relationships and boyfriend girlfriend or or boy boy whatever i i'm i'm talking about family because all of this relates to family i mean i what you said today is uh pertinent to any relationship and so i'm wondering how you deal with lying especially if you're trying to work that's, a rigorously honest program <laughs> yeah now that's a really interesting that's a really interesting question thank thank you uh for that um, I would first of all make a distinction between two ideas. Now, the word honesty gets used for both ideas, but let's split. Let's use the word honesty and candor. Candor is letting all the secrets out, letting it all hang out. Honesty is, is what you let out is true. What you let out is candid, but you can be honest without telling the other person everything. Um, there's a line in a Sondheim musical about not forcing a flower to open. Um, Jonathan is straight deal this is the other meaning of honesty is straight dealing there's no scheming there's no plotting there's no subterfuge um 
I wouldn't, I don't allow into my inner circle or even my middle circle people that engage in plotting, scheming, or subterfuge. I've got it at the moment with a couple of colleagues at an organization that's anonymous, um, where I do some work, where the behavior is fundamentally dishonest. And I'm not engaging in it. I'm not setting anyone. I'm just, I've removed myself from the argument. I'm not interested in it because there's dirty work afoot. Um, there's a Don Pritz line, which is deadly. It's, I don't know how to have a healthy, sick relationship. And you can have bounded interactions with people who are very unwell and behaving badly, and scheming and plotting and planning. So I know it's like two countries. You, you, you can have your wall and your defenses and your, and your um, towers with the people with machine guns. You can keep yourself safe with boundaries, but the more boundaries there are, the less scope there is for intimacy, and that's why boundaries are deadly. Um. One thing that about uh, dis, dishonesty, there's there's an interesting thing. I, I I I'm sure I've told this story before, but talking to Jim W of San Antonio about do you reveal to the other person? Because I think Mikaela, you said something about emo- honest, honesty about emotions. Um, Jim's advice was uh, spilling all of your emotions into the relationship. You may be being honest in the sense of being candid or revealing what is going on inside. But when I'm upset, what is going on inside is a lot of ego rubbish, which I will regret and turn my back on in once I've done the inventory and done the work. So although it's in one sense honest to let all of that stuff out, once it's running around in the relationship, it's very, very difficult to take it back. And um, one of my... Most useful phrases that I use a lot is discretion is the better part of valor. It's more important to be discreet than it is to be recklessly brave with disclosing things. And I had, Jonathan and I have had one very difficult conversation. There have been little tense ones, of course, one has those little bits of bickering. But there was one serious conversation about 12 years ago. And it was very interesting because it, it, it could have been an argument in the wrong hands, but what we did, there were, there were, there was an exchange which went, which went on for maybe two or three hours, and there was sometimes up to twenty minutes silence while he was thinking of his next thing to say, or I was thinking of my next thing to say, because we wanted to make sure that what we were saying was honest, genuinely honest, and what is genuinely honest is not necessarily the first thing that comes into your mind. Often what is genuinely honest is the thing which is underneath the first 100 things that come into your mind. So I'm very, very careful about speaking when I'm upset in the relationship, and so is he. And I respect the fact that he conceals what he's feeling when he's in one of his little dark moods, because he and I both know that none of that is really real. So it's not a, it's not a clear cut issue, this question of honesty in relationships. And an old friend of mine, Ed Wiener, whose ability to interact with people in a healthy and boundaried way is unparalleled. She said that unbridled honesty is death to relationships. And I think she's absolutely right. There's a question here, Tanya, uh, Mention codependence and uh, dependence. Can you give an example of uh, the difference? I, it's very difficult because they're sort of technical terms, really, but to, I would understand dependence to be getting someone to do things for me I should do for myself. Um, codependency, uh, there are a couple of different definitions. One that I found incredibly helpful is... Uh, paying insufficient attention to my own beliefs, thoughts, 
values, attitudes, feelings, actions, and internal world, and paying far too much attention to yours. So being thoroughly entangled with the other person, but completely unconscious of oneself. Another way of, of defining codependency is where I've got uh, responsibility confusion, which I talked about when we did step one the Al-Anon step one a few weeks ago. It's where I don't take responsibility for me, but I do take responsibility for you. I won't let you take responsibility for you, but I make you take responsibility for me. So I think for me, dependence is one aspect of codependency. If you want a good writer on codependency, I, I, I rate Anne Wilson Schaefe, S-C-H-A-E-F. She's very clear about codependency um so someone asks um did it take you time to get to the point of learning practicing all these principles in your relationship and how much of your success was about finding the right person how important uh is it to be with someone who also follows such principles um that's a very good question a very i think it's, a, it's an interesting one so I'm by absolutely no means a natural as I was a complete, I was a walking disaster with relationships when I was drinking. Uh, I'd form uh, uh, fierce and violent attachments to people based on almost no knowledge. I barely knew their name, but uh, immediately I'd imprinted on them like a sort of duckling or something. Um, and huge, just completely merged with the other person and entangled in all sorts of ways um i was very lucky the relationship with someone else uh in recovery for the first uh, it, during my first 10 years in aa he was someone who was naturally very very boundary and i learned a lot from him um uh it has absolutely been a journey this it's not something which happened instantly and i i i made some major changes in how I handle things over just over the last year because I realized how badly I've been getting certain things wrong. Uh, particularly with, with uh, uh, what I didn't realize was nagging until it was pointed out it was nagging. I thought I was being polite and considerate and careful, but actually it was what I was doing was a form of nagging. The subtlety, the damage you can do with subtle things which repeat can way outweigh the damage by a single incident. It's the, 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 the sort of dripping of, um, of, of minor things, in my experience, my other half can be far more damaging, far, far more difficult before they trust you again. One thing I want to say about Makeda's question about um, honesty. Um, I remember... Uh, in an anonymized form, of course, I was talking about a situation uh, with someone I knew in AA with Jonathan. I didn't tell, it, tell him who it was, and I just set it out very neutrally, very anonymously. And it was about a, a relationship where one of the two people didn't trust the other. I can't remember which way around it was. And Jonathan's answer was very, very helpful. Um, uh, this is the stuff about relationship is just like with AA got all its medical information from outside AA. I got all my traditions information from someone out, outside AA as well. Jonathan said, either you trust the person or you don't. If you don't trust them, why are you there? Uh, so I just trust him. And that's the end of it. Um, one last aspect to that question how important is it to be with someone who also follows such principles? I, I think, you see, I think that's the key to this. Um, in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, there is some exchange, if anyone is old enough to remember that. Um, there was some exchange where I, so, so, so Buffy um, was, w w would have this sequence of, of dysfunctional, relationships and there was something about uh uh her being cookie dough and not cookies she was not cooked enough to be eaten as a cookie she was still cookie dough and the advice that was given to me by someone in uh in Al-Anon from Oakland 
Um, he said, if you meet someone and they've never had a relationship which is longer than six weeks and you love them, you've just met them and you love them, what makes you think they will succeed well, with you where they failed with everyone else? And I thought that was very that reflected my experience i had between these two between these two successful relationships uh happy relationships in between the two there were there was a, a two-year period of absolute catastrophe one catastrophe after another and the problem was i was i was i was uh going for people who were not remotely prepared or capable of having relationships people who've never been in long relationships before but were in their 30s um i was talking to someone earlier today about relationships uh, and, and you know what, what do you look for and I, I i think looking for something for me is a complete disaster if i'm looking for something i'm probably trying to reenact some scenario from the past to uh, get the ending to change, to take vengeance on all the past failed relationships by rolling them up into a current relationship. Just to, no. So uh, Tom Weston says is um, if you walk into the room and your eyes lock and you know they are the one, don't even say hello. They're going to be, they're going to be, he says, turnip juice in a Ming vase. They're going to be a beautiful Chinese lacquered box you buy at the flea market and you get it home and it's got a dead spider in it. Um, I know enough about me to know that if I'm attracted to them in the ordinary sense, um, I should, uh, I just, I, 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 need, I, I need to just get out of the building. Uh, what do you do instead? <laughs> um, the advice that was given to me was cultivate character, cultivate one's own character, emotional maturity, flexibility, unselfishness, pragmatism, a sense of humor. Uh, to cultivate virtues to bring to the table. As I tell you, um, when your elderly mother is taken into hospital and you're driving an hour back and forth to the hospital every day and you don't know what the hell is going on and the doctors are confused and uh, they can't diagnose what is the, the every diagnostic test fails your mother is deteriorating she's in her 90s you still have both of your jobs and you have to run the household still um someone who is attractive in the bedroom is of no damn use in that situation you want someone kind practical and resourceful and i would exchange a lifetime of sex for someone who is a rock in a two-week difficult situation because that's the thing which is irreplaced completely irreplaceable uh the the uh the things which make people exciting and interesting are usually in my experience the things which are absolutely deadly in a relationship um one of my difficulties with jonathan for the first few years was how little he spoke and how little he engaged in a lot of the detail of my life it wasn't remotely interested but i discovered that that placidity and and ability not to be distracted by minor details in his own life or anyone else's are precisely what you need in a crisis you need someone who is a strategic thinker who is not going to start twittering about the latest little detail that's come up someone that thinks before they speak so M m the, the advice that was given to me was to develop your own character was the if you want a good relationship develop your own character don't worry about what you're looking for because you won't know 
just know that it is not what you think it is. Um, uh, that was the that was the best advice. So to answer that person's question, absolutely, that's the case. It's about finding someone who is fundamentally good. And also the other thing, it's this line straight from the big book. If you're with someone that is fundamentally able to adjust and grow, then you're onto a winner. Now that can be because they're naturally like that. There aren't many, but they do exist or they have a proper, pro, like an actual program, like an AA or Al-Anon. So they don't have to be in recovery, of course. Uh, but if they don't have a self-cleaning mechanism, then you're not going to be able to do the cleaning either. Because that, if they're resisting that own process, you really won't be able to affect the process in them that they're resisting in themselves. And I've noticed with uh, uh, Jonathan uh that he naturally keeps an eye out for how he is affecting me i'm getting better at keeping an eye out for how i'm affecting him um and that is not and this is the interesting thing that's a virtue that you would not get you would not see in the first six months of dating someone it's something that gets revealed only incredibly slowly and so the other piece of advice that i got was um uh, and I got this in early recovery and it stood me very in great stead with this eight year relationship I had with someone in AA and we, our lives went in different directions. We wanted to live in different places, do different, spend our lives in different ways, which is why still best friends, but we're no longer in a relationship. In that relationship, the advice was get to know the person first. Don't rush for the bedroom. Don't even go to each other's houses just to make sure that it's nice and bounded and be absolutely sure uh, what you're doing. Uh, and I did that then. In other relationships, I wasn't so cautious and uh, I paid for it. Uh, so Tom's advice to me also was, um, if you want to know who to date, just go and meet some people. Find someone you consider boring and go out with them six times. And then see if this, this is someone you want to see a seventh time. And it's just like the Al-Anon thing. Don't just go to Al-Anon and say, well, I've been to one meeting. I've made my decision about Al-Anon. No, 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 no. Go to six, go to six different Al-Anon groups and then start to see. Because my kind of addict uh, wants an instant gratification. If I'm not immediately overwhelmed, I think there's something wrong with the person. And it's the other it's the other way around. So I've got a lot of good advice. Basically, what you want to do in 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 AA and Al Anon, I think, is to hang around lots of really, really old people who have been married for 30, 40, 50, or 60 years, and you watch what they do. Because that's how I've learned everything. I've watched really, really old people and I've talked to them. <laughs> um Debbie. Okay, so Tim, thank you. That was really interesting and it's uh, helping me to pull my bootstraps up. <laughs> I can see some really um, uncomfortable patterns of behaviour that I've had and uh, needless to say, I'm not in a relationship of um, the kind that you're describing, but it's helped me to look at other relationships as well. But Tim, at what point did you look at Jonathan and Jonathan look at you and you both knew that you wanted to marry may I ask that is that okay yeah well marry was a different question um when we met he knew straight away it took me a few months to realize because I was battling against my old program which said you have to be you have to be super excited in a kind of pathological teenage way otherwise there's no romance in it mm -hmm. so I was fighting against old tapes he had no old tapes to fight against um, so, uh, and he reminds me of this, of how slow I was <laughs> to realize what was, what was going on. But there we go. Thank you for that. You. Uh, Patrick, I think we're out. Oh, I think there's a question here. Maybe not. Okay. So, um, I think we're out of questions. So Patrick, do you want to, um, 
close us off. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, just to let everybody know that uh, Tim's on uh, vacation for a, a few weeks, so we're not going to have the Tuesday workshop for the next three weeks. We still have our Monday workshop, our Wednesday meeting, and all the other. We're just going to take a break here. We'll start up again on the 9th of, in three weeks' time, it's the 9th of August. We have Dr. Fred Luskin. Fred wrote a great book called Forgive for Good. And uh, actually, he is a Stanford PhD, but he's a great guy and uh, very down to earth. And um, he does talk about his own experience with forgiveness and how he learned. Uh, And he wrote a great book on it and talks a lot about um, gratitude, actually. And uh, he's anyway, so Fred will be with us on the ninth, and then we're looking forward to Tim. He's, he tells me he has some other ideas up his sleeve for workshop. Thank you, Tim, <laughs> uh, on his return next month. So uh, with that, once again, we'll remain open. If anybody's looking for sponsors, we have a, a group uh, sponsorship WhatsApp. We do endeavor to find people sponsors. And with that, um, uh, over to you, Tim, to just take it out with a prayer of your choice. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you to everyone for being here. Let's attempt the serenity prayer. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.